I need to know about why our city is in such um, what often feels to me to be terminal decline. You can see why when you call up to say, hey, my water's not working, or there's these massive uh, power cuts, they'll tell you we don't have cars. And when you drive there, I think none of the lights work. The traffic lights are uh-huh. often out. The street markings have faded uh-huh. many yeah. years ago. So that, for me, the name change has just become performative politics. You know, it has no meaning. Welcome to the State of the Nation. I'm your host, Mike Sham. And as you know, you have heard a lot from me on the subject of the city of Johannesburg. Um, It is a city that I have grown up in and I love. And joining me today, I think, is about one of the few other people that love Johannesburg as much, and that is uh, the well-known columnist and journalist, Feriel Hafiji. Feriel, welcome. Hi, Mike. It's lovely to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you on. I know it's been a bit of a struggle to get our diaries (laughs) right, but yeah, we are. You know, And and while we've been trying to get our diaries right, uh, Joburg just gets worse, doesn't it? So Joburg has had its um, sixth mayor appointed, Um, since 2021. That is a huge level of instability for any city, and this is a fairly major city, not only in South Africa, but in Africa and the world. And the problem with that is we don't have a stable administration. So every new mayor changes, changes their whole mayoral committee, which is like the cabinet that runs the city, but then also they change the entities which I think plague our lives so much. And that city power, Johannesburg Water, the Johannesburg Roads Agency, pick it up. All of those which are meant to run the city are then changed, new boards, new executives. And so what happens is in the stasis and in the instability, we feel this intense service decline in the city. Now, those bodies that you speak of, those yes. companies that are, are providing the, the vital services, the city power, rand water, etc., those are meant to be non-political organizations. Yes. That, that was the aim of taking them out of the city control directly and making them operate independently. And shouldn't they not be out of the reach of the politicians? Is that not the intention? Ideally, yes. So what, so what is it that they change? Sure. So in 1999 or 2000, um, when the ANC was just beginning to get its uh, feet under the desks of governing and how to do it well, you had uh, two excellent city managers, Roland Hunter and Ketso Gordon, who came up with this idea of the best way to run a city like this is to place these entities at arm's length away from the politicians, put the best people on the boards, and that should see the city grow. You're insulating them from political interference. In fact, the exact opposite thing has happened. Because that's where all the big spending takes place, politicians have never been able to keep their hands off those entities. And if I fast forward us right to right now, last week I went to a Johannesburg uh, regional office of the ANC and was aghast to find that the regional secretary there felt that it was quite fine for the party to place board members into the entities. It's the opposite of the intention um, of, of, of why these entities were created and it's helped me understand everything I need to know about why our city is in such um, what often feels to me to be terminal decline. And don't we even have uh, some of the senior members of some of the alliance partners, I'm thinking of the Patriotic Alliance, actually chairing one of the boards? Uh, which one? Charles Saliers, right? Isn't he? No, Charles Saliers is now the special advisor to the sports minister, Gayton McKenzie. Okay. So I haven't but he seen, was in one of the. Um, he, he was chair of the Johannesburg Roads Agency Board. Um, he's not a, a political um, office bearer, as far as I know. He's chairman of the party. Is a chairperson yeah. of the Patriotic Alliance, but now he's moved on to national, and I believe that the the same thing has happened at mm. the JRA. You still see all these parties putting in place their cadres onto those boards. Is that legal? Um, it's not. The law is, there's a lacuna in the law on this. So the Public Finance Management Act says that um, they can't hold, uh, office bearers can't hold uh, positions. So where the gap is, is that parties are saying that the um, the provincial secretaries, their chairpersons who are not elect in elected positions, they can go onto these boards. 
obviously that was not the intention of how they were set up, but it's not illegal in terms of the PFMA or the Municipal Finance Management Act. Okay, so it, there's a gap. Uh, it's an easy way to steal. Um, you just go for it. You, you put somebody at arm's length, uh, one of your mates. It's state capture done on a municipal level, isn't it? Yeah. So what we're seeing at Johannesburg, and I've called it that many times, including uh, when Herman Mashaba was the DA mayor of the city, is what we have in Johannesburg is local state capture. Uh, patronage networks get put onto these boards and they disperse and distribute jobs and contracts. Um, and that will help you understand why, even though the city spends maybe... I think it's 30 odd billion on its staff bill, maybe you know better than me. So that's a massive, that's like almost 50% of the city 73 billion rand budget. It gets an additional 10 billion rand in grants from the National Treasury. It then spends an additional 20 billion rand on contractors. And that's the number that without uh, etc., we have to begin to understand because I think that's where the patronage siphoning off of the money is happening is in that 20 billion rand. So it's in things like the AFRI rent contract, for example, for fleet uh, rental, which was stopped by the previous um, uh, uh, coalition, and then the first thing the new coalition does is extend that. Yeah, it's in so it's in building leasings, um, it's in leasing of waste trucks that you see. Uh, Pick it up doesn't run its own fleet; it hires in people to do that. It's in fleet rental. Um, it's in numerous other areas. Those big city budgets, if you look at them, there's a measure of extraction happening in all of them. And so, if your fleet rental contract keeps stopping, starting being uh, siphoned off to cadres, etc. You can see why when you call up to say, hey, my water's not working, or there's these massive uh, power cuts, they'll tell you we don't have cars, um, or we don't have parts. It's, it's all explained by how these systems operate in the city. Now, the, the, the crazy thing here is that there seems to be no good guys in the story. Because you mentioned when Herman Mashaba was mayor that the same thing was in place. Is that right? So I think that there are good people in the city. I think many of us would know excellent councillors who work day and night, who work themselves to the bone like Bridget Steer, um, who's now quit because the impacts on her health were so severe. So I think it's it's not fair to paint with s such a wide brush and say that everybody's yeah. rotten, they are good people. But what I don't think people understand is that it doesn't really matter much right now about who your mayor is until you don't fix those systems of capture or local corruption. We're just going to see the story repeated again and again and again. I'm sure Herman Mashaba, um, even Dada Morero, certainly in Popolazzi, they had their hearts in the right place. They want to make Joba work, but each of them hasn't been able to do a great deal. Firstly, because they don't complete a term, but secondly, because I don't think we're looking at the administration of the city. And for me, that's where the rot lies. Now, Ferial, with something as as simple as this, um, you know, surely it is. Uh, it one would imagine quite easy for um, the law enforcement bodies to to do something about it. What explains their lack of interest in in uh, you know assisting in cleaning up the city? So, uh, if we think of ourselves as citizens, what's our right? Who should be doing this work? Who should be caring for the homeless people so they're not on the streets so much? Who should be ensuring that you have regular water in, in your studio here, that you probably haven't had to install a massive system to ensure that you're not harmed if city power um, undertakes all the cuts it does? Who picks up all the dirt that litters everywhere across mm. our city, be it suburb, be it township? There's several layers that we... Um, that owe us those kind of services. It's your inspectorate, it's the people who do bylaw enforcement, and it is the massive number of JMPD officers that we have. And fourthly, it's the Johannesburg City Ombudsperson. So we're being failed at four levels of accountability, and your guess is as good as mine as why that happens. Are the cops too busy um, setting up um, 
tra traffic stops so that they can fine you because the city's so short of money, therefore it's an essential, essential revenue driver? Or are they moonlighting? Why are they not doing the, the work that they're meant to do? As a journalist, when I ask these questions of the city, I must say the responses are quite um, rote or it's a completely opaque body. They don't seem to see the need to answer either to citizens or even to an institution like the media. So uh, uh, now if one looks at the political landscape within Johannesburg, you mentioned the instability, the six mayors since 2021. And if you roll back, uh, you're going to add another couple to that, uh, another four to that by my reckoning, if you go back to 2016, yes. right? So that uh, puts the double figures in, in less than a decade. You know, um, is that part of the play? You keep the politics so unstable that nobody's looking at the, very, at the money? Um, no, I don't think it's part of the play. I think it's because there's such fierce contestation for power in the metros. Um, it's where the big money is. It's where people build their political careers. And it's because of us as voters are obviously casting around for alternatives. We're not voting for lots of People are not voting for the main incumbents, which used to be the ANC and the DA in the city. Um, the ANC has lost its um, core voter bases in Joburg in massive ways. You know, if you drill down into the 2024 election, you'll see that the party did really, really badly in places which are regarded as its strongholds. That would be Soweto. That would be the inner cities. That would be um, Ekuruleni. It really did badly, and that's because of the state of the city. So what's happened with coalitions is also some of how we voted. We voted for new parties. We're placing our hopes elsewhere. So lots of small parties coming up. And personally, I don't think that's a good way to go for the city. All these micro parties show themselves to cross yeah. the floor very easily. They're quite self-interested. And for me, what would best suit our city is a local version of the government of national unity, where the bigger parties come together, recognize they have a crisis, and drive a joint program of reform. Not going to happen here. The ANC and the DA really despise each other in the city. Now, yeah, you know, you're touching on, on the obvious next point, which is we've had this, uh, this coalition, this government of national unity, call it what you will, largely led by uh, the ANC and the DA. 60% yes. nationally, which would then make uh, a similar coalition in a place like Johannesburg and even Gauteng, for that matter, an easy thing to get with a stable majority. But yet they are completely at each other's throats, right? And they will not do it. Yes. Uh, now, you, you know, in your opinion, what is driving that overarching hatred of one another? You know, I went along to the first sitting of the Gauteng legislature um, on the same day that Parliament was reaching this um, important uh, government of national unity deal, beginning to sign off on it, the different parties there. And we assumed the same thing would happen in Gauteng. And in fact, on that first day, it looked like it would be. Um, the DA speaker was uh, nominated and elected into position. Um, the DA nominated um, Panyaza Lesufi as premier from the floor. So it really looked like there would be that tunadrung. And what we'd see was a parallel version of what was happening nationally in Gauteng and that it would trickle down um, to Johannesburg and the other cities. I think that the, the money's too big here, yeah, you know, that... Um, interests that we still to put our hands on swerved it in the other direction because recognizing that a provincial government of unity or a local government of unity would up in too many apple carts um, too much money would be lost to these extractive networks and so they pushed the politics in the direction of their pockets this is my um, thesis that i'm building up to and beginning to report out because those other interests are too powerful and they lie in the administration or they lie in the political parties, I'd argue less so in the council or in the legislature. Yeah, and um, the DA has done themselves no favours in this uh, area where it seems like they quite simply don't have 
the will, the stomach, the inclination to even fight for Johannesburg or Gauteng for that matter. That's what it seems to me. Is, does it feel like that to you? It certainly feels like that to me. And I've spoken to a lot of people. You know, it feels like poor old Celia Brink is hung out, hung out to dry. There seems to be absolutely no interest from the DA that's safely ensconced in the Western Cape to come up here and do the dirty fighting in Johannesburg. They certainly didn't support mm. poor Palazzi. Um, I guess that there are... Um that there are people who work hard. I was at a function here three weeks ago with the Friedrich Niemann Foundation and Helen Ziller spoke there. And she's, I think, spends a lot of her time in um, Gauteng now and in the cities because they desperately want to win the cities. But if you ask residents on the whole, my experience in this area which we're sitting in, which is Parkhurst, I've tried very hard to get hold of our ward committee um, to engage the councillor in more constructive and meaningful ways to say there are things happening here, um, what are you doing about it? And I found them to be less democratic than, than you'd wish, like less responsive to their mm. citizens than you'd wish. So it was with some interest that I heard Helen Zilla saying to, and it was mostly a meeting of DA supporters and also councillors, you're going to face massive competition here because I think what's happened in these parts of Johannesburg, these councillors have just been in their jobs forever and forever and they take it for granted that they'll be re-elected. Now they've got real competition. I have to say, though, if you look at the timeline of a guy like Martin Williams, um, he used to be an editor and now mostly you see him at the reservoirs or substations. Mm. You know, they're doing the real bootstraps work and across parties, I'd argue, they are still good councillors, but they need help to do their work properly. Yeah, so um, yeah, we, we're going to see more and more contestation. Um, the next local government elections are not that far away. Less than two years now. Less than two years, and it's going. it looks like it's going to produce another shit show. It's the only way to put it. You, you're <laughs> probably going to have even more fragmentation than last time. Well, I suppose the key message from from people who care, like I guess we do, is that fragmentation doesn't suit the city. Uh, it doesn't suit the city's people at all. Often these small, small parties, some of them may have real constituencies. My experience of them, um, say with Colleen Makobele, the previous speaker, Margaret Arnolds, the previous speaker, Cabello Guamanda, the previous mayor, they, they have like one, two, three seats. And so they have no real obeisance or fealty to their citizens. Um, they are only, they what I call political entrepreneurs. They're looking for a foot up into this mm. game through politics. Maybe they have a tiny number of constituents and they try and blow themselves up through exposure to the media, the cameras, and to the, the goodies of office. But it hasn't really served us well at all to vote for these small, small parties. And I do think what we need in Joburg is a consolidated um, vote behind a party which has shown itself that it's listening to people and does very important work in council, not just line its own pockets. Yeah, well, we uh, we 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 sort of wait with bated breath. But we the, th do. the thing that that astounds me is that if one looks at all of the major parties, barring I suppose or, or many of the parties, let's put it that way, we exclude the DA, which is now headquartered and in their little enclave in the Western Cape, and uh, and the IFP and MK that are in KZN. You know, the, many of these parties are in Johannesburg. They are headquartered here. The people live here. This is where they have their houses until they finally scrape, steal enough money to buy a house in Cape Town. But yet they live here and they seem to be quite happy with the way things are. I don't, I wonder, you know, I've tried to uh, put questions into President Cyril Ramaphosa about how does he think about Johannesburg when he lives in Hyde Park? Mm. Um, and I'm sure by now he's made a plan around water and electricity, but you can't make a plan around potholes. You know, he's mm. got a convoy of 12 cars. Does he not notice yeah. um, the condition of the city? Um, the condition of the city, which my colleague Peter Detroit of News 24 pointed out recently, this is the city on which South Africa is built. Mm. It's still where the majority of the economy 
um, is is made. It's where yeah. it's produced from. There's an excitement, a cultural excitement. There are people who want to build and do things here. So do they not notice these things? You know, m my present bugbear and where I'm off to after we speak today is the Johannesburg Library. Mm. Your central library has been closed for three years. For me, that is quite, quite criminal because not only is it a repository of knowledge used by researchers around the world, it's the place where young children and young people in the inner city go to study to get free Wi-Fi. How can you close such a place for three years? The ANC is across the road. I have been lobbying people there nonstop to say, have you not noticed the state of our library? Your HQ is across the road. You know, yes. Do you not see? And I wonder if that isn't what's referred to as the bubble of power. You don't see out of the bubble when you're in power. Yeah, I must admit, uh, if one if one looks at the performance of of somebody, you know, obviously history will judge the fact that we somebody saw fit to make somebody like Cabela Guamanda, the mayor. You know, history will judge those people quite harshly because he was a complete incompetent. But yeah, you know, I kind of support him on one thing, and I do wish we could hurry the name changing up on, because you know, obviously. Um, you don't want the memory of what was once a functioning city associated with this. Rather change the name. By all accounts, William Nickel wasn't a very nice guy. But I'm sure even he in his, uh, in his grave is pretty happy to take his name off a street where the streetlights no longer work. I must say I found it quite shameful, um, that parade of changing the name to Winnie Mandela Drive on a day, a very important day for her memory, and they didn't even paint it properly because yeah. you saw the paint. <laughs> Did you see that? Yeah. It was melting off. It was terrible quality yeah. paint. And when you drive there, I think none of the lights work. The traffic lights are yeah. off and out. The street markings have faded yeah, many yeah. years ago. So that, for me, the name change has just become performative politics. You know, it has no meaning, really. Yes. But when you do see streets blowing up in the, in the city center, yeah, you kind of wish they changed the name of the city. Well, that's a story I'm I'm off to do tomorrow, I hope. Um, so over a year ago, there was this mass explosion. We saw taxis flying up in the air. A man sadly lost his life. Many people were injured. Businesses along what used to be Breast, that area of Breast, ruined because commuters sim simply don't go there. Then I heard this is going to be an amazing place. You must see what they're building. They're putting in um, places for the hawkers um, to have proper stalls. There's ablution facilities. This is going to be a, the remake, and it's the model of how Johannesburg's going to look. And I thought, great, I even did it on uh, the slot I do with John Pullman on 702. Lo and behold, last week we read that the contractor has run away with tens of millions of rands. And this week I'm going to ask my colleagues to take a drone over that street. Um, and you'll see that nothing has changed. So this is how we are mistreated by the administration and surely time to say enough. Yeah, and, uh, and obviously the, the, the change has to happen at the ballot box. Which, in many ways, it did in the in the last uh, uh, national election. Which you know, and, and I've made this point many times. I, I don't think South Africans vote completely differently general election to local government election. We haven't seen evidence of uh, of voting patterns change. They tend to vote the way they vote. Now, um, you know, there is no doubt that uh, the ANC is is heading on is on the wrong side of the slope. But yet they've chosen to grimly hang on in Gauteng, deny the unity, we've discussed this already, deny the unity arrangement which has happened, to, to keep their hands on power. Now, it's a, it's a risky idea because if one doesn't improve the place, you are, are going to go down with the sinking ship, which it looks like they are, because we have a new mayor, Dada Marrero, and... Ladies and gentlemen, if you've ever been to Johannesburg, please, I implore you, if you haven't been here for a while, please come and have a look. It looks like Gotham City. It looks like something out of a movie. It's just, you'll recognize the places, sort of, but the place is in a state that it defies words. 
We are soon to host the All Blacks at Ellis Park. It's going to be an embarrassment. Can I come in there and say that's not true? I was up doing an event there. I know it's too true. I drive there every day. Can I say that that's not true? Yes, please. On Sunday, I went on a trip to see what's been done by Josie my Josie in that eastern mm. part of Joba. People have been working on it for, I think, nine months now. And I think it's important to maintain what Barack Obama called the audacity of hope. So Josie my Josie, you know it, is run by Anglo-American, Nando's, um, a number of banks, etc. And their focus has been fixing up from Ponty all the way to Victoria Yards, which is where one of the Nando's head office is. And the work that's been done has really been amazing. There was first the Nelson Mandela cleanup day, which was from the Ellis Park Stadium. So that area is probably cleaner than I've seen it in years. This weekend I went there. They have put in new paving everywhere. And the precinct, which got to be quite grotty and scary to drive past. I once took an Uber to Victoria Yards. The guy said to me, ma'am, this looks like that war. And by that war, he meant Ukraine. Mm. So real efforts have gone to clean up that whole area, to use the All Blacks Bok, uh, bok game um, in the way that we used the 2010 World Cup um, to catalyze a bigger fix of the city. So that whole area has been cleaned. But the more amazing thing is you can now get on a how train, anyone, get off at Park Station, cross over, and Park Station is looking amazing, cross over into um, the Prasa line and get off at the Ellis Park Stadium. Of three minutes it'll take you. Completely clean, absolutely safe, there'll be a cop on every station. So Gotham City has really been shifted. Will it last beyond the game? I certainly hope so. But what you see happening, and it's against the odds and it's by the best of us in Joburg, is the civil society movement called Josie My Josie, where people said, this can't be happening to our city. They didn't. They, they said, we can't only leave it to politicians, it's not going to happen. So you've seen 12 on and off ramps of the city changed. The Nelson Mandela Bridge has been lit up again. Good stuff happening. The point is, I'm not sure that you can build that good stuff on the foundation that we currently have, and that's where the political question comes okay. in. Well, then I stand corrected. and uh, Do go know, have a look. I, I, I was there just last week. So, well, was uh, it still a mess? That's an, an unbelievable mess. Yeah. You know, on, you the Bertram like Road, on the Bertram on Road side, uh, yes. you know, I'm doing an event at what was the Standard Bank Arena, yes. now the Ellis Park Arena. It, the road is, you know, Parkhurst quality. But anyway, the, it... It's shocking. You, Parkhurst you, quality, just for your yeah. viewers and listeners, is terrible. <laughs> yeah, you can't drive through Park. You have to now buy a 4x4 four four if you live in Parkhurst, mm -hmm. which was one of South Africa's cleanest little little neighborhoods. Which brings me to the next point. And you 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 sort of set it up there when you talk about Josie Majosi doing stuff, civil society doing things. Now, I recently hosted Herman Mashaba. And, you know, Herman Mashaba's big sticking point and boy, does he mention it again and again and again, was do you mow lawn in Santon or do you put toilets in deep slurt? That eventually became his defining issue that caused the rift as within his party when he was mayor, right? And, uh, you know, with his party sort of saying, you've got to do something for the ratepayers. Now, it seems like ever since then, once that bond between civil service, between the, the city's services and the ratepayers got broken, it seems to have never been repaired. Do you see a situation where they return and, and, and give services to ratepayers at some point? Or I'm talking about things like roads in Parkhurst, water in suburbs where they are collecting rates. Or do you think we're going to have all of that money either diverted to their own pockets or areas where rates aren't paid? And then that leads to that wonderful question of a rates boycott. So, um, you know, I, I enjoy the author uh, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie because she, she writes beautifully, but she wrote this essay and did a TED talk called The Danger of the Single Story. And I think that's something that our politicians like 
the quote you you had from Herman now, they really fall victim to um, by thinking that there's this binary. You either serve the suburbs or you serve the townships. It is completely dated. Um, with an 83 billion rand budget, if you spend efficiently and spend well, there's enough to keep to do both. And we actually did have a mayor who did both. Under Park Stow's time, what he did was join up Soweto and the city of Johannesburg. Obviously, Soweto had been created by apartheid architects and planners as the dormitory city, the labor supplier for the gold um, of, the, of the city. So he changed that. Thus, you have highways, you have parks, you have... Soweto is, is, is a great it's city almost a suburb, by, yeah. by, any, by any means. So this old idea of them rich white people and then black township poor people, firstly, it no, no longer exists because if you look at an area like where we are here now in Parkhurst, it's, um, I, it's almost majority black-owned mm. families if you, if you go look at the numbers. Similar in, in many other areas. So that old race binary simply doesn't work. And if they were spending properly, they'd realize that you have to support areas where there's growth because that in turn feeds a redistributive network. You also have to make Soweto City work properly. When I was there last, opposite the BRT in um, Dipkloof, you had pigs grazing on open ground. That can't be right for an area which is a hot spot for tourism and a place with such a great history in our country. So I really don't agree with Herman's reasoning that you have to choose between cutting the grass mm. in Santon versus putting in toilets in Dipsluit. I think if there wasn't so much theft, inefficiency and poor spending, you could actually do both. Now, we, let's talk money. We talk about 80 billion rand um, city. Um, once again, I argued with Herman recently that I don't think that the city should be uh, lending, uh, borrowing another two and a half billion from some French bank, which we're going to have to pay back. And he was saying, why do you want the city to grind to a halt? And I can't see how yet another loan is going to get the city right, especially one which is insignificant compared to the budget of the city. Do you have more information than I, I do? I do, actually. Um, so uh, that loan is supposed to be for infrastructure. It's supposed to be ring-fenced for um, yeah, but probably we, energy Yeah, we had money that was meant to be for COVID water. as well. So that's the problem, yeah. is that it leaks out into operational expenditure. Mm. Um, the city simply cannot – it can't collect – very well, as we know, its billing system is decades of chaos, um, and therefore we have no guarantees. We have n we've never seen what the terms of that loan are, and I think it's a job of journalists like us to go and ask the national treasury, which has to sign off on the loans, show us the terms so we know how that money's um, meant to be spent. Ideally, we should be seeing what the budget is for every ward in the city and d developing literacy. That, by the way, is what our ward committee should be doing. They should be able to say to you, Mike, this is what's allocated for streetlights, for libraries, for resurfacing in your ward. We, we don't have that degree of transparency. Um, I also think it's time in Johannesburg, not for a boycott, but that we put our rates into a common pool and hold it much more tightly so that we know it's being um, properly spent for the benefit of That's the definition people, of a boycott, isn't it? Especially, not really. It's you're withholding rates, it from the city. You're yes, putting it in to But it's not a boycott. You, it's a rates redirection, which is what they tried to do in Durban. And I'm not... Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not being semantic here. It's, it's, you don't keep it in your pocket. Yeah. You still yeah. pay it. You pay it over and to you, somebody. And, then, it's and then we have a greater say of how that money is dispersed. But before that, there's another step which might work here that is seems to be bearing fruit in Durban. And that's a constitutional, um, I think it's section 163, 153, where national and provincial governments say to the city um, administrators, mayor, etc., you're making a big mess here, and they basically place it under administration of a top team that comes in and sorts things out. I firmly believe that's what we need um, in Johannesburg. Although we do know that that won't, wouldn't happen in Johannesburg because we know that 
the Gauteng ANC has kind of gone rogue and they are supporting what's going on in Johannesburg by definition. Well, I think they're going to have to be pushed by national because this you can't have your major city of which still the major city, but Cape Town's catching up pretty yeah. damn fast. You can't have your major city crumble to the ground. And so I'd argue that that's what's needed. Mm. i got to start going. Okay. Well, we'll wrap it up by by asking whether the uh, national has the stomach, once again, stomach for this. They haven't tackled Gauteng, which in itself is a whole separate discussion because there we're also seeing um, people, you know, they're in – they're responsible for very few things and seem to be incapable of running them hospitals, etc. We haven't even got there yet. But, uh, you know, uh, National seems to be quite happy with the performance of the Gauteng government, with um, Panyaza Lasufi now sort of getting himself a militia, for example. They got, um, the ANC National, Gauteng got 34%. So mm. I don't think that, I think National government is firmly aware of what's happening here and that my sense is we've after 30 years surely our biggest lesson has to be that I'm certainly not going to sit and wait for government to do the right thing we have to as citizens raise our voices and be incredibly loud until it gets so loud that they can't not hear what needs to be done in this beloved and precious city. Well, let's hope that they do this. Uh, we are going to get uh, Wayne Devonage back on here where once again we'll be talking about the wonderful issue, which I think the time has come to talk rates boycotts, rates de redirection, call it what you will, but not handing the money over. The idea of the city getting another two and a half billion is like giving the alcoholic uh, key to the liquor cabinet. Um, I don't see how that's going to help. Uh, but let's see. So, you know, we'll get Ferial back here to uh, keep an eye on Johannesburg. But in the meantime, go if you live in Johannesburg, go rent a 4x4 four four from Pace Car Rental because you're going to need it to navigate the cities and make sure it's got very good headlights because you've got no street lights and make sure you've got very good sensors because uh, the, the traffic lights don't work and make sure that your license is updated because that's the only thing that our metro police do which is to stop you to check that your car is licensed we no longer have speed control we no longer have traffic police doing traffic services so from a very very dejected johannesburger to a johannesburger who is trying to do more ferial thank you so thank much you for so joining much, us Mike. uh we'll keep an eye on this and to everybody that joined us today subscribe to the state of the nation Come live in Johannesburg, see what life's really like. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.